Niagara Falls to Ontario. We have Jason and Ruha, also a political commentator, with us. Uh, Jason, good to have you with us. Uh, let's have your comments. Oh, well, I'd like to echo that sentiment very much. You know, they have the old saying, whatever doesn't kill me makes me stronger. And I think in the case of Maritza Hashemi, this may very well be the case. I mean, this is not going to intimidate her into silence. If anything, this is going to uh, shore up her resolve against the injustices that she has spent uh, practically decades of her life, you know, committing herself to combating. So if the goal of the United States, and this seems very likely was true, was uh, to intimidate her, to intimidate any kind of dissenting opinion within the media, and it certainly seems like that was the case, it's certainly not going to work in this case. Uh, uh, Hashemi has shown that she will not be intimidated into silence. She, as soon as she was released, she adamantly denounced the treatment that she had been received. She was very far from uh, being someone who was intimidated. And I think that in the in the law Long run, this will backfire on the United States because it would not have the intended effect that it was that they were looking for. This will mm -hmm. only reinforce uh, uh, mainstream media or even uh, mainly uh, non-mainstream media who have been in opposition to much of the U.S. policy, both foreign and domestic. So I think on on all levels, given the ridiculous reason that she was she was even detained to begin with uh, this whole endeavor will end up being a a negative for the united states i mean this this won't silence press tv it won't silence her uh this will achieve e essentially nothing in terms of trying to label press tv as uh as a foreign agent or a, a ridiculous accusation to begin with so i i really think that this may be an exercise of futility for the u.s because if it was, this was really all about uh, silencing dissent, it certainly had the opposite effect. It made many people, uh, many of whom who had not even really ever stood, uh, stepped out publicly against abuses by the United States, to do so for the first time because of the ridiculous way that Hashemi was treated by the FBI, by her detainers. So I think that in the overall, in terms of the spirit of those who wish to resist the U.S. and its abuses of human rights, this was a tremendous backfire. Mm -hmm. It might be, this thing might be legal, but uh, and we hear also that uh, law has been very rarely used and on special occasions. Some of them believe that this is being used uh, whenever they want to kind of uh, pressure or to kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, let's say punish. Uh, minority groups, uh, especially uh, black uh, Americans, uh, this, they resort to this law and they do what they did to Marzi Hashemi also. Well, this kind of law, this uh, material witness law, was one of the things written uh, with uh, post-9-11 in mind. Uh, much of the uh, anti-terrorism legislation that uh, circumvents human rights and, uh, you know, associated industries with that. Uh, th this law generally is not used, but it is something that the that the powers that be do keep in their back pocket that they want to use in case they feel that there is a reason they need to use it. So it, it's not it's not a common practice, but it's one of those deadly weapons that is there, and they will pull it out if they feel that they're threatened enough or they feel like there's uh, a, a good reason, whether, whatever that in their mind may be, to use it in the, the, particularly this kind of case. Uh, the whole thing is very, it, it, it's, it, it's almost nonsense. It's all of this over questioning what the what legal status press tv an entity which does not exist in the united states should be classified as i mean it, it, it's it's wholly nonsense anything that is really outside the united states it, it doesn't need to be registered by anything the united states demands i mean this is a, a kind of what extraterritorial bureaucracy or, or something to, to that effect. I mean, these kinds of laws have been used against a, a lot of people since 9-11, uh, oftentimes just out of sheer overreaction. I mean, how many people who were simply Arab who were pulled off of airplanes after 9-11 and, you know, were essentially held without charge for, you know, varying amounts of time for essentially just the suspicion they might be a terrorist based on the, the, the color of their skin or the, the country of their origin. So 
I think that we, we definitely see that it's that while it's not a common practice to simply hold people as material witnesses and to treat them in such a despicable manner while doing so, but I think this has a lot to do with trying to pressure Marita Hashimi, uh, like-minded people, and to essentially carry out hostilities against press TV itself. I think the United States has never been known as a country that was very uh, welcome and uh, open to anybody who dared criticize them. And I think that the fact that the United States went to to use such a law, such an extreme such, such an extreme law to detain uh, Maritza, certainly shows uh, the kind of mindset they were having, that they went to this unnecessary extreme, just to make a point, to carry out this kind of hostility to try to intimidate her uh, as not just as a person, but as a person who speaks out against injustice. It was wholly unnecessary to do so, but the fact that they did decide to use such, such a draconian law to detain her uh, shows uh, how much disdain they really have for her and the subject matter behind which her detention was based upon. Mm -hmm. The U.S. empire being afraid of even their own shadows, but then, you know the thing is now the, the U.S. empire is uh, now kind of divided because President Trump has his own empire and his own ideology and whatever else because just a few hours ago, he criticized the, the U.S.'s own intelligence, you know, apparatus for, uh, they, the, he called them naive, he called them passive, and you name it, regarding uh, their opinion of Iran. And uh, uh, <laughs> that could be, you know, in your interpretations, you could also uh, have this factor in mind, that Mr. Trump has his own ideology and a different system in mind. Now, let me ask uh, Jason, we talk about human rights, and then uh, there is also another aspect, and that is the different kinds of freedoms that the U.S. is boasting of, one of them being freedom of expression, freedom of press. What became of that in the case of Marzia? Well, we can see it very clearly did not uh, did not apply to uh, Hashimi at all. I mean, we've seen this happen to other people, other U.S. Uh, citizens as well. Uh, basically, it results that you have the freedom to say whatever you want, so long as you say what we're willing to say. I mean, this is very much the kind of uh, false choice thing, like when uh, when a, a kid is told by their parents, when you're old enough, you're old enough to make your own choice. When you make the one that we're going to tell you to make, the kind of thing. And I think that's a, a pretty good way of putting it. You're free to say so long as you say what we want you to say. So I think that is really like the the kind of false free choice that exists. I mean, this is uh, this is uh, a limit that you would get with any kind of liberal democracy. You can speak out against a certain injustices, certain uh, things that happen within the system. But when you talk about something that is a systemic problem itself, something that arises from the very nature of the creature itself, uh, this is something that you're, you're not allowed to say. I mean, we have, you know, people on the mainstream media that uh, lament the treatment of African Americans, and many of them inside the mainstream media. But if you were to talk about how this is a systemic problem, if you were to talk about how the system is responsible for it, rather than saying that it's merely the act of some kind of uh, poisonous outside influence, where you see this as, oh, it's this corrupt politician who does this, oh, it's this police officer that's just bad, but they don't see it, and they will refuse to acknowledge how it's systemic to the system itself, and that is the system that should be criticized more than the individual who carried out the actual act. You're allowed to criticize certain aspects that they feel are external to the system, but not so much as something being a product of the system itself. Now, the United States has the largest prison population in the world. Even when you calculate the numbers, it's even by percentage of the population, even greater than any kind of ridiculous numbers that are completely unverified that they make up about the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which they denounce as a totalitarian state. And even they, mm -hmm. by their own numbers, are even worse than the countries they call the worst in the world. And it's very clear that the judicial system has a very clear racial bias and yet these things are not considered a matter of human rights we had previously the UN wanted to investigate prison conditions within the United States they wanted inspectors to go into US prisons see what kind of lives that people in prisons in the US have and they were completely denied access well, what is it that the United States is actually afraid of if someone were to come in and take a look at this if there was ever an example 
of uh, you know uh, of a prison industrial complex of of a, a, a an even totalitarian system that would be the United States with the way that it locks people up, often on completely ridiculous grounds, often on fabricated grounds. Uh, we've seen how many times people have been exonerated on murder charges because they were completely uh, essentially just framed by police looking for someone to blame. In other cases, simply something a, a very simple drug possession, a very minor non-violent offense, and then end up getting 10 years in a hardened prison facility for something that is almost a complete non-issue for society. So I, I think that this idea that somehow America is the champion of human rights, you know, while they even continue to run Guantanamo Bay inside of Cuba, not just the fact that Guantanamo Bay itself is a human rights violation, but it's a violation of the sovereign territory of Cuba as well. So I, I, I it's, it's really fantastic to ever listen to the United States claim to be a champion of freedom and democracy when any time they are faced with any criticism, uh, any criticism that comes outside of the mainstream, any criticism that isn't made in the way that it is preferred to be, is completely demonized. Can we think of another more democratic, let's put it this way, more humane way of treating uh, Mazi Hashem? I mean, apart from, wouldn't it be better to uh, have actually another option, another way of treating this? Uh, uh, rather than uh, actually uh, what they did, arresting her and detaining her and, you know, maltreatment and all of that. Well, there's perfectly legitimate ways of treating people that you want to cooperate with you. As she said in her very own speech, just come to her with a subpoena and say, we want to ask you questions about Press TV. We want to ask you about its relationship to the Iranian state. And she said she would have done so. It was completely unnecessary to treat her the way that she was. I mean, we wouldn't see, you know, a, a rich person in the U.S. who are being asked to testify being treated in this way. I think you'd probably see maybe a poor white person being treated that way, but uh, definitely being a woman, being black, uh, being a follower of Islam certainly really worked against her in this case to treat her in the way that she was. But I mean, it was wholly unnecessary. It's you, you, All you would have to do is ask her to do it, make reasonable accommodations. You don't even have to give them a five-star hotel, just a motel in an easy place to stay. You know, I'll give them a free and fair access to their to their families. And, you know, monitor their telephone calls if that's what you you feel you need to do. There could mm -hmm. have been very easy, very, very genuinely humane ways of doing this, mm -hmm. uh, but they chose that this was not going to be the way that they were going to do it. They were going to be totalitarian about it. They were going to be very discriminatory about it. They were going to be very unnecess unnecessarily harsh and just completely circumvent all concept of human rights on this issue. Yeah. Now let's go to uh, London. Now uh, let's go to Jason. Uh Jason, uh, we talked about a lack of media coverage, and uh, they're, you know, they were not interested in stories like that of Marzias. It was not only the media; it was also the governments who are always talking about human rights, democracy, and you name it. And uh, not even one of them uh, reacted to such a thing. Whereas, if uh, Marzia had been a Fox News reporter, for instance, and then it could have been quite a different story. Oh, certainly that would be the case. Uh, Maritza is not part of the the journalism elite. She's not part of the media elite that are primarily responsible for shaping the narrative of what it is that's happening, whether that be through uh, controlling the actual narrative, framing it in the right way, or omission by facts. The fact is she is not one of those elites. She is the one who questions power and does not pander to it. So it, because of that fact alone, you would certainly see that her plight was certainly ignored by the mainstream media. I attempted to contact uh, one uh, mainstream media outlet re regarding it, and I was met with the same answer, that they were not interested. It wasn't something that they 
they felt would be of benefit to their broadcast. Okay, that's they're right. They can choose not to do that if they want, but it does speak volumes about what it is that they want to do. And I figured even by sending it to a Canadian channel, at least it wasn't even questioning the Canadian government. It was it was questioning the U.S. government, and they still weren't interested in hearing it because they are towing relatively the same narrative on this case both against abuse against African Americans, uh, because blacks are targeted in Canada as as well. And Canada still has a very similar hostile foreign policy towards Iran. And I was not frankly surprised by that at all because she is not a part of the mainstream. Uh, Mostly it has been coming out of alternative media, places like Press TV. Uh, Many citizen journalists like myself have have covered it to uh, various degrees and we've done the best that we could to try to get that message out there, be it through uh, social media, through online videos, uh, everything that would be accessible to people who were not in the the dominant mainstream narrative. Although I'm sure many of us tried to get it into the mainstream, public rallies were held specifically for trying to get the attention of the mainstream media to tell this story because it is an important story. It is a someone in the media being a, being oppressed, someone in the media being targeted, but they still just don't want to hear it. They don't want to even cover this, yet they lament the entire treatment of Jamal Khashoggi merely because he was one of them. He was one of the immediate uh, elite, part of uh, the Washington Post, and I believe has worked for several other high-profile outlets as well. So this was uh, very disheartening for a lot of us trying to call attention to this, and we simply were... um, had very limited success in this part thanks to the deafening silence that was given to us by the mainstream media. Although I, I like to think that the efforts that a lot of people did put through, uh, people, uh, citizen journalists, uh, alternative media like Press TV bringing attention to it, certainly had a very positive impact on her whole struggle against the U.S. government. Yeah, especially.